Hello everyone, we're going to start at 3.30. If I can just ask everybody to just ensure that they are muted, it should just hopefully ensure that we don't have background noise um, disrupting things, although my husband's decided that now's the time to do something in the garden. Um, so hopefully you won't be able to hear that quite as clearly as I can. Okay, so I make that 3.30. I will apologise to one of my fellow committee members, Jackie, who uh, very kindly put together a holding video for the start of our online events. And um, because of a mad morning that I have had, I haven't been able to download that yet and to um, get that up and running. So apologies for that. And that is why you've got the, the rather bland holding slide on the screen. So as uh, many of you will know, my name is Julie Temple. I am the co-chair of the Essex and Ipswich branch. I am also head of the BLHR and employment team at um, Birkett Long. And I have, um, well, since the COVID-19 crisis hit, I think I've presented three or four events with a, a legal perspective um, around the COVID-19 issue and the challenges that are being presented for HR managers. And this is the latest one, which we've, we've earmarked as a lockdown, lowdown, just to help you make sure that you are completely up to date. Now, as we go through, for those of you who've not attended um, some of these events in the past, hopefully down towards the bottom of your screen, you should have a toolbar where you can um, access the chat box. So if you want to make any comments um, or anything like that, then please feel free to, to do so as we go through. You should also have a Q&A um, section there. And I can see someone's popped a, a question in there already. I will do my best to monitor that and certainly have a look at that at the, at the end. I'm planning to spend around about 45 minutes-ish rounding up some of the some of the changes that have have taken place since our last event the main one i'm sure won't surprise you is to have a look at the furlough changes which were announced by rishi sunak on friday at the evening <laughs> evening briefing which has presented me with some challenges to make sure that i know what i'm talking about for you all today and hopefully I will be able to, to pick that all up for you. So please do ask questions using the chat box, any comments, uh, sorry, ask questions using the Q&A and um, any comments and that sort of thing, use the chat box if you could. And I'll do my very best to have a look at that as we go. So on the agenda today, we've got the job retention scheme. I'm gonna to touch very briefly on the self-employed scheme, have a look at sick pay and the test and trace, and also just have a look at the return to work issues, which are likely to be coming up. 
So just an important piece of information there on the screen, which is that today's presentation is up to date as of yesterday. For reasons that I will not bore you with, I haven't had any chance at all to check if anything has come through this morning. I would hope it hasn't, not least because it's been, it's been the weekend and it's not a Friday evening. So hopefully everything that I am saying to you today is correct. But in any event, I recommend that, um, as always, as things are moving as quickly as they are, that you make sure that you check any legislation changes and that you check for the most up-to-date information and guidance before you are making decisions in relation to employees. So I've had a comment that someone can't see a question um, or the chat. So in, if you hover your mouse around towards the bottom of the screen, you should be able to come up with a, um, you should you should come up with the toolbar and you'll be able to click on the chat box and also the Q&A. And I'm thinking about it. I might not have set it so that you can, there we go, let me see, there we go. Hopefully you can now see the questions. Um, Liz, if you wouldn't mind just letting me know if you can now see it, because I think I'd set it so that they weren't visible um, and on the fly. I've hopefully changed changed that for you. Okay, so Leslie's also saying that we'll see we'll see if it the settings come through as we've gone and changed it. Um, and we'll we'll crack on because there is there is quite a lot of um, a lot a lot to to get through. So Friday evening at five o'clock. I don't very often tune into the daily briefing, but I did this this week and Rishi didn't really let us down. It's, it's fair to say there were a couple of surprises as well. Pleasant ones, I think, certainly in terms of flexibility from the furlough scheme in relation to employees from the 1st of July. But where were we? We have a situation where employees can be placed on furlough and if they are placed on furlough under the job retention scheme, then they can get a, they, they, the employer can claim for them 80% of their salary, but capped at £2,500 per month with no obligation for the employer to top that up to a hundred percent. And that is 2,500 plus the employer national insurance contributions and minimum payments under pension schemes. So that is where we were. Following the announcements on, or the announcement on Friday, we have a situation where for June and July, that remains the position. Employers can claim 80% capped at £2,500 plus employer NICs and pension contributions. From August, that position changes slightly and we are in a situation where employers can claim 80%, but they will have to pay the employer NICs and pension contributions. So a small, a small change and moving towards a drop in what can be claimed from the government. In September, that changes again so that overall employees will still be receiving 80% um, capped at 2,500, but subject to any top up which the employee 
uh, might or might have been agreed with the, the employer. However, we move to a situation where the employer is contributing 10% as well as their employer national insurance contributions and pension contributions. And finally, in what is very clearly intended to be, and I choose my words carefully, um, the last month of the scheme, employers will be required to contribute 20% of the salary up to 80 with the government or being able to claim from the government 60% under the furlough scheme and again still having to pay the employer national insurance and pension contributions. Now I, I saw this on um, LinkedIn, this graphic, it's from, I'm sure Rishi himself didn't design it, but it is from the HMRC and I think it quite usefully just demonstrates the change and the shift that we are going to see over, over the, next, the next few months. As I say, I, well, Rishi was very clear in his announcement that October is going to be the last month of the, of the scheme. I remain quite circumspect about that and it will very much depend on how well the restrictions perform and if we do see a second spike in terms of the infection rates etc. Ultimately HMRC are, are seeking to protect as many jobs as they as they possibly can and we will just have to wait and see how this how this plays out. So that's a, a overview of the situation um, and that's just uh, picking up on the on the points there. You'll see that there are some figures in for September and October. So 70% will be capped at £2,190. That's what could be claimed from the government under the scheme. October, um, 60%, and that's capped at £1,875. And I say capped on the basis that there's a change from the 1st of July that I will come on to deal with in a, in a moment. So looking at the second bullet point on the, on the screen there, you'll see that the 10th of June is a critical date. Why? The scheme is going to close to new entrants, and that is both employers and employees, on the 30th of June. So from the 1st of July, only employers who have claimed under the scheme and only employers who have claimed under the scheme in relation to certain employees can continue to furlough those employees from the 1st of July. So the 10th of June is an important date as it is the last date that an employee can be placed on furlough and complete the current minimum three weeks of furlough. So if as an employer you want to be able to take advantage of the, fur the flexibility of furlough from the 1st of July and I'll come on and explain that in a moment, your employees need to have been on furlough from the 10th of June if they have not already been furloughed and completed a three-week cycle. Now there has been some discussion and I had a, a meeting with my team this morning to run to run through it. Originally when I heard the announcement I had understood that it would only be employees who are on furlough from the 10th to the 30th of June who you will be able to use the flexible furlough scheme for. Having looked at it over the weekend it is very clear that it is any employee who has completed a three week furlough that can be flexibly furloughed from the 1st of July. 
that is quite clear um, from the updated guidance and also um, I think there's been sort of three sets of, of publications from HMRC. One is the announcement from Rishi himself, one is a summary of the situation and the third is the updated guidance where they've basically put a, an announcement at the front of the different sets of guidance but it is clear from that it's anybody who has completed furlough. So as I say over the next 10 days employers are going to have to think about who hasn't been on furlough yet and who they might want to place on furlough so that they can complete a three-week cycle prior to the 30th of June and that is obviously going to be quite beneficial as I come in to um, talk about flexible furlough but I'll just finish off on the final points there. I made a point of, of stating the maximum contributions under flexible furlough those contributions might change so I'll just show you the next the next slide from the 1st of July employers will have the option to bring furloughed employees back on a part-time basis so they can work part-time and they can be on furlough part-time employers will have to pay in full for the hours that the individuals are working and on the third point there you'll see that the the claim under the furlough scheme is going to be based on a proportion or the, 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 the amount that can be claimed under the furlough scheme will be based on a proportion of hours worked as against hours not worked and on on furlough and a little bit further down you will see that individuals employers will have to provide information about the hours that they have worked compared to the hours that they have not worked and also the hours that they would usually have been required to to work the there is no restriction as to any proportion of time worked as against time time on furlough that is entirely for agreement between the employer and the the employee so we might find that actually some employees because of the number of hours they work take them over 2500 pounds in which case my view will be, although I'm waiting to see what the guidance is, that there will be no ability to make a claim under the under the furlough scheme to contribute to, excuse me, um, contribute to the ability uh, or, or to contribute to to that pay. But we will have to wait to see what the what the guidance um, provides for there. One important point in terms of mechanics, you have to agree working hours to cover at least one week periods. And that has to be confirmed in writing by the employer to the employee. We don't have any situation where it has to be in writing back from the employee, although we may find that the direction, the treasury direction that will inevitably follow will impose some level of um, complexity that we don't currently have within the, within the current guidance. So at the very least, you should be confirming the information in writing to your employees. I would always advise that you get a return confirmation if at all possible anyway so please do continue to follow best practice in that even though you're not required required to the final point there is is a little bit self-explanatory um, but if an employer doesn't have work for a furloughed employee to return to 
under the scheme, both from the, from the 1st of July right through to the 31st of October, they can be furloughed for the entire week or the entire period. They do not have to carry out work. The caveat is, of course, the degree to which an employer will have to contribute to the money that is passed across or being paid to the employee um, based on the what we've, we've just looked at in terms of 10% and 20% from September and October onwards, in addition to the um, NICs and pension from August. Um, also, if the employee for any reason isn't able to return, then um, perhaps they have childcare issues or, or something like that, except there are obviously issues around that and for, for you to consider around whether or not that's an appropriate approach to take, but they can, excuse me, remain on furlough. And for example, if the workplace isn't open, et cetera, et cetera. So that's where we are in relation to flexible furlough and furlough from the 1st of July. I'm going to have a quick look through the questions and I will get rid of those questions while we're looking at comments. Um, so, I'll just look for the ones which relate to the flexible furlough and then I'll double back. From August, when the employer has to pay some money, is this on top of the government amount or goes towards it? So that, Tiffany, that's the point that I'm a little bit unclear on. If an individual works and, for example, the amount of work takes them above the 80%, I don't know the extent to which it will be 80% plus a contribution from the government or it is what you've already been paid. My instinct is if you are entitled to more than 2,500, then there will be no, no right to claim from the government because you're, in effect your, your employees are, are working and they have clearly have work to do. Now I hope that answers that question, but as I say, I, I simply don't know at this stage. That's what my, my instinct, instinct tells me. So in terms of overtime, um, I'm just in the process of making sure that our notes are all up to date, that contractual overtime should be included within the calculations for furlough. And I'm um, sorry, I have, a, I have a roommate who's being rather noisy. Um, yeah, so contractual overtime should be included. Um, and that is, I, I don't remember the date that the, the, the guidance changed on that, unfortunately. But the once I've finalised the notes, I'm pretty sure that's included in there. It will, it will have that in there. Okay, so question around maternity leave um, and an individual returning on the 11th of June. Funnily enough, I was talking to a client just this afternoon and if they are due... Hmm, I think you're... I th so they're returning the 12th of June and you would then have placed them on furlough. My view is that technically speaking, they will not be able to complete furlough such that you could put them onto flexible for furlough from the 1st of July. The reason being, um, I haven't had a chance to check this actually, but my understanding was that anyone wishing to return uh, early from maternity leave has to give eight weeks notice. 
obviously there is not eight weeks between now and the 12th to bring that date forward and I suspect that this is a group of individuals that in HMRC and Treasury's rush to get this flexible furlough scheme out they haven't quite thought of all of the ramifications and I hope that at some point HMRC, well inevitably lots of employment law solicitors, barristers are all out there trawling over all, all of this stuff and I suspect that we will find that there will be some changes and some exceptions to this situation so that employers can place certain people onto furlough even though they haven't completed a, a three-week furlough cycle previously. Do, do, do. So yes, um, Liz, your understanding is correct. If somebody has already completed or will have completed between the 10th and the 30th of June, a, th a full three week furlough cycle, the minimum period that it has to be, someone has to be on furlough currently, they will be able to be placed flexibly on furlough from the 1st of July or indeed back onto permanent furlough, if I call it that. So they don't have to be on furlough between the 10th and the 30th for you to be able to claim for them past the 1st of July. Yep, so that answers the next question there as well from Debbie. And I'll, I'll move just just a couple more questions and then I'll move on. Um, what I can now is agreed must cover at least one week. Does this mean Yes, so in, in effect, as I understand it, under the flexible furlough scheme, you can agree working hours week to week, but it has to cover a week and it has to be confirmed in writing. So this is something that you can start to consider and you can earmark with your employees um, and start to discuss with your employees what flexible hours you might want them to work. So if somebody normally would work five days and you know that you've got enough work for them for one, you can agree for a period that must be at least one week that they will agree they'll return one, one day a week and under that they'll be paid by the employer for the one day and by under the furlough scheme for the balance I think up to £2,500 £2, so hopefully that answers it. Um, so furlough since the 14th the 4th returned on the 2nd can be furloughed. Yes, so Trish, your employee furloughed from the 14th of April, returning 2nd of June, they will be able to um, be re-furloughed from the 1st of July um, under, under the scheme because they've completed a minimum of three weeks on furlough prior to the 30th of June. Okay, so that's um, flexible furlough. Obviously, I will round up any questions at the end and I'm hoping that we'll have a, a chat with uh, my branch committee members available to answer questions as well and, and just have some discussion at, at the end. So we'll move swiftly on. We've got a self-employed income support scheme that has been extended as well as the furlough scheme for employees. So we have a first grant which covers three months from March of £2,500 per month and announced on Friday, Rishi has um, stated a further grant again for a period of, of, of three months, which is anticipated to be the last grant that can be, can be claimed and that's um, £2,250 per month to reflect the reduction that is going through 
on furlough and um, in the notes, I can't remember the dates now, in the notes that we will be uploading to the system for you to be able to download the dates by which you can claim, I think it's something like the 13th of July is the last date you can claim for the first grant and you'll be able to claim from August onwards for the second. I'll leave that there, that's just briefly who can claim under the self-employed scheme. I will upload a copy of the slides as well, so if you want to um, download these they'll be available for you, but as I say there's also notes that will accompany um, today's presentation that you'll be able to download either from the Birkett Long website or I will upload them to WeTransfer. So when you get an email through Eventbrite, uh, just remember that that link is only active for, for seven days. That's caught me out a, a couple of times. I will hover on this slide just briefly. I realise I'll probably move that across, I'll move that out of the way. Um, we, up on the slide is, is, is the guidance about what is considered uh, or when a self-employed individual is considered to have been adversely affected by the COVID-19 crisis, which I think is quite interesting. So it deals with if they're unable to work because they're shielding or they are self-isolating, they've been sick with COVID-19 or they have caring responsibilities um, as a result of, of, of COVID-19 or their business has in some way been affected because of supply chains and that, that, sort of, that sort of thing. I included that, I know it's not potentially directly relevant, but it, it is of, of interest to see what the thinking is around what is and isn't COVID-19 uh, related and, and when something has been adversely affected. So if I just move on to sick pay and the test and trace system, which became active on the 26th of May. So on the screen there, you will see a list of the different types of employee that you might have within your organisation. So anybody who is well, and working will be entitled to their normal pay. You may have reached an agreement for reduced hours. You may have reached an agreement that although they are well, they are on furlough. But in the normal run of things, if they're well and working, they'll be on normal pay. Technically, there should be another group on there thinking about it, which is those who are on furlough and receiving whatever has been agreed as furlough pay. Anyone in mandatory isolation or quarantine, which might apply to people traveling, um, are entitled to SSP, as is anybody who is self-isolating because they have symptoms themselves or someone within their family has symptoms. Now, from memory, I think if you have symptoms yourself, you should be self-isolating for seven days anyone within your household should be self-isolating for 14 days and both of those categories are entitled to SSP. I've just realised there's an erroneous cross through the next one. Social distancing, those who are social distancing from the 16th of April, I think from the top of my head, are also entitled to SSP. Um, as are those shielding and then finally to bring up to date in relation to those isolating under the test and trace system um, regulations have been brought in to deal with those individuals and they are also entitled to SSP. Entitlement to SSP is still subject to usual eligibility requirements so they have to meet the lower earnings threshold for example 
SSP is paid at the rate of £95.85. And pence. That has not changed as a consequence of COVID. It did increase, um, I think, the 5th or 6th of April. Um, now, in relation to the COVID-19 situation, anyone who is absent relating to COVID-19 is entitled to SSP from day one rather than day four. And it is only those who are absent be, or deemed absent or incapable because of COVID-19. It's not other, other absences. And in terms of proof of, of sickness, we do still have fit, fit notes, which can be used, but we also have isolation notes and the, sorry, SSP is statutory sick pay. Um, the, so we have isolation notes, we have fit notes and we have test and trace notifications, all of which are entirely acceptable from an employer's perspective to um, evidence an individual's entitlement to SSP. It still remains the position that Evidence is not required for the first seven days um, beyond, for example, a self certificate that a business might require to be um, passed across to them. And that can continue, you know, there's no reason why you shouldn't continue to continue to do that. Reimbursement of um, statutory sick pay. If you are an employer with less than 250 employees on the 28th of February, you will be entitled to reimbursement of up to two weeks SSP in respect of your employees who are absent because of COVID-19 or related to COVID-19. And that is absences occurring on or after the 13th of March. And the portal, the, the online system that enables you to um, process that claim commenced on the 26th of May. I'd be interested if uh, I haven't had any feedback from clients who've um, had to, to go through that process. So if any of you have reclaimed or started the process to reclaim statutory sick pay, I'd be interested to, to know how that's, that's gone, but it is open for you to, to start that process. So test and trace became live, as I mentioned last week, and on the following day, I inevitably had a raft of um, um, client inquiries. To summarize it, um, under the test and trace system, the, an individual who has symptoms can and should be tested for COVID-19. They should, well I've used must on, on the slide there, they must self-isolate for seven days and members of their household must self-isolate for 14 days unless there is a negative test result for that individual in which case that individual can cease their, their self-isolation, as indeed can the members of their, their household. If, however, there is a positive result, then that individual should continue to, to self-isolate, as indeed should the members of their, their household, and they should complete the, the minimum self-isolation period. Thereafter, they will be the individual who has had a positive result will be requested to provide details of individuals that they have had recent contact with. So that is direct contact or they have been within two metres of individuals for over 15, 15 minutes. And in those instances, anyone who is notified because they have been in contact with that individual or may have been in contact with that individual must then self-isolate 
for 14 days themselves. Now, obviously this has implications for employers in the sense that somebody with symptoms will have to self-isolate or individuals they have been in contact with will then have to self-isolate. And if that happens to be individuals within the workplace, that's clearly going to be quite disruptive for businesses. However, the guidance um, quite rightly makes the point that it is um, going to be less disruptive than perhaps a, a wider outbreak of COVID-19. Um, and it makes some sensible points in terms of following guidance around making workplaces safe. And there is a, a, a raft of guidance that was introduced going back a couple of weeks ago now for both general guidance, but also specific guidance, depending on the type of, of, of workplace that you are, you are in. And almost stating the obvious, the guidance is very clear that employers should be supporting individuals when they are isolating. And that includes allowing them to continue to work from home if they are well enough. Um, but obviously not asking them to attend the workplace um, if they are in a situation where they, they are self-isolating. And I, I'm having to find myself uh, checking how I'm expressing myself on the basis that um, I'm obviously not in my workplace, but I am at work. So sometimes I might use work and workplace interchangeably. Um, and on that slide, it should be it should be workplace. And I suspect we're all going to have to get into the habit of differentiating between being at work and being at the workplace. The key thing there is if they're able to work, they should continue to work and they are entitled to be paid equally. They are also entitled um, potentially to remain on to remain on furlough. And that obviously deals with the. The final point on the slide there, if somebody is having to self-isolate, you should look at them working from home. You should look at them remaining on, on furlough and furlough pay and potentially allowing them to take annual leave so that they are paid full pay rather than perhaps um, furlough pay, if that's the case. So just to confirm there, they are entitled anyone self-isolating under the test and trace system they are entitled to SSP and the notification that they will receive under the system should be shared with the employer as evidence now in in my view um, that will include um, evidence from a family member or a household member where they are had to notify they have symptoms and in turn had to um, then contact other people, etc. If if that makes if that makes sense, so that's the test and trace system. So let me just bring the questions over and let's just have a look if we've got any around that. Um, so someone's just said in terms of trading profits more than fifty thousand. My understanding is self-employed where the trading profits are over, you wouldn't be able to qualify, but there are other support mechanisms out there. There is a useful summary of the support, financial support that's available um, in the COVID-19, the, the, the gov.uk COVID-19 um, page and obviously individual guidance behind, behind all of that. So someone here is asked about they're on furlough and in week four of furlough reported sick with non COVID-19 related illness signed off. Can they remain on furlough? Um, in my view, I think technically the answer to that question is if it's not COVID-19, related absence, um, they can't benefit from SSP on the basis it's COVID-19. And I think technically they shouldn't 
be allowed to continue on furlough, but it would in turn mean that they have to be paid 100%. But I'd have to, I'd have, to have a think about that one. Um, but that, that's my, my instinctive answer there. So the next question, annual leave, first to the 14th, then on furlough from the 15th for the first time. If you're not placing them on furlough until the 15th, they will not be able to complete the three, the three weeks furlough before the 30th of June. You would need to place them on furlough before, well, by, by the 10th. So in that sense, just to make a point that was up for grabs early on in the furlough scheme, furlough and holiday can run side by side. So what you could do is write to the employee, place them on furlough from the 10th, but explain it will run side by side with their holiday. It won't impact their pay because they should be paid 100% for at least their statutory holiday, by which I mean um, four weeks holiday. I'm just trying to think if it's five, the 5.6. I think it's 5.6 actually. Um, so that you could, you could put them on furlough from the 10th, but still have their holiday running to the to the 14th all right so that's those questions so um moving on to returning um i've got the wrong heading there actually um looking at workplace closures and starting to to return i've come across these three sayings over the past nine or ten weeks um the first one i'm sure you're all very very familiar with which is um, that we ought to be looking carefully at which parts of normal we want to we want to rush back to and um, i was very pleased to see a contact of mine emailing me to say that they are adopting flexible working as of um today i think it was actually rather than um looking to return to the particular office, they will be working from home with the ability to work in a, in a different office in, in the future. And I suspect we'll see a lot of that over, over the coming weeks. And of course, Twitter, I think, have said that their staff don't have to return. And Barclays quite early on said that they were looking at um, their office space, particularly in, in London. And the other two I thought were, were, were quite interesting. One was by JFK and they look at uh, the, the Chinese way of describing crisis. And the first character is danger, and the second character is opportunity. And I think that's a very, very good way to look at the situation in which, in which we are in. And I'd ask you to, to bear, that in, bear that in mind. Final one, Winston Churchill, in light of VE Day recently, is a very sensible and opportune moment to uh, refer to him and it highlights the the, the the two approaches in terms of a pessimist and an op optimist so pessimist sees up difficulty in every opportunity and op 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 if i can say the word optimist sees the opportunity in in every difficulty and i think as i say these three three quotes sum up the situation in which we all find ourselves really as a business and and as individuals and i think highlights the the two approaches and the, the, the state of mind that we could we could choose to to follow as we return to normal i've just put on the slide some potential issues that you might want to start to think about in light of the changed furlough moving from the 1st of August. I suspect we won't see the raft of redundancies I was initially anticipating on the 1st to be effective from the 31st of July, but we might start to see changes, excuse me, from the end of August as employers are expected to contribute more and more and more towards the, towards the salaries. It's worth just mentioning that furlough pay can be used to contribute towards notice. So if you are able to, and you're planning to make redundancies um, or to, to restructure, 
then it makes sense for that to happen sooner rather than later so that you can get the maximum contribution to the notice pay under under the furlough scheme i've touched on flexible working and the potential that individuals will want to look at flexible working more into the future and i know that someone had mentioned um someone asked a question earlier on i think around if they have been working from home does that give them the contractual right to continue to work from home i, I think just on that point my view is obviously the longer that it lasts then the more likely it is that it will become in quotes custom and practice that an individual can continue to work at home i think employers will have a strong argument against that on the basis that it was a forced approach and i think if if employers were minded to then they could require individuals to return to the workplace but it's, as i said, go back to the point that i was making earlier in terms of the rush to return to our previous normal um, i hope that businesses will in, will recognize the benefits environmental cost etc and embrace the ability to work from home perhaps more than than they have in the past and it's sensible to make a relatively obvious point which is that working from home in the future might not include working from home in a less than ideal workspace it might include working from home without a partner or family um, intruding on your your time on the basis that children will have returned to school and partners might have returned to their otherwise normal workplaces so working from home is likely to be quite a different experience and concept into into the future recruitment well-being just a quick word on on that one um, obviously we are all being challenged in very different ways as a consequence of, of, of this situation some will have um, children at home some might live alone and some might have suffered unfortunately bereavement and each of us are going to face our own challenges in terms of returning to a new normal and potentially returning to the workplace if that is going to be required of us and that in turn is going to represent a challenge in terms of performance and potentially in terms of, of, of disciplinaries and we will need to think about how we might address that into into the future just in terms of the lifting of lockdown we're starting to see um, workplaces open up non-essential retail i think is looking to start from the middle of of june the guidance is still to work from home where we can and that that should be the default for the for the foreseeable future so for example at Birkett long we haven't reopened the office we have a small number of, of skeleton staff who are in each of the offices dealing with with post and request for wills and that type of thing but otherwise the office is is closed and we need permission to go into go into the office and we're keeping a record of who is in there from the perspective of making sure that the workplace is is covid19 secure which is one of the the new the new catchphrases and as i say there was a whole raft of guidance the link is on on the screen there to specific and general workplace guidance to help you to to covid19 secure workplaces if working from the workplaces is necessary into into the future now if you haven't carried out a covid19 risk assessment then that is something that you should be doing sooner rather than later i know that the hse has some guidance um, available 
and we work with a company, Praxis 42. I know that they have an online um, system that you can, you can access. But if you have your own health and safety advisors um, or you have a health and safety representative, then you should be engaging with them to discuss and put in place um, your, your measures going forward. Um, where possible ensuring two metres social distancing is, is observed and that you've got a process for cleaning and, and good hygiene to, to state what I think is probably quite obvious. So over the next two slides we've just got a, a decision or two decision trees in terms of if somebody continue, can continue to work from home, is the workplace closed, can social distancing be observed and all of that has to factor in flexible furlough uh, as well from the from the 1st of July. As I say, slides and notes will be available afterwards. Um, so you don't need to, well, by all means, you can take a picture of, of, of these if you, if you wish. And then this is just a tree in terms of looking at options around furlough, reducing hours, etc., which is as important as it was when I first put it together at the start of this crisis, as it will be as we move into a return to the workplace, more workplaces opening up, and as we start to look at and embrace flexible, flexible furlough once we, we have our, our heads around it. So that is what I wanted to cover to bring you up to date with. It's worth me just emphasising that there is different advice and guidance within England, Wales and Scotland. What I've discussed today is relevant insofar as um, we're sitting in England. If as well you have locations in Wales and or Scotland then you're going to need to have a look and make sure that you are completely up to date with the, the, the guidance that applies in, in those locations. Just to reiterate what I said at the start, which is that this is up to date to the 31st of, of May. Um, do check for legislative guidance and make sure before you do that, um, you're checking up to date guidance, checking legislative changes before you're making any decisions because it is going to be a risk, although everything is moving so quickly, and I anticipate that employment tribunals will be, will be sympathetic. If you're acting on out of date information, then that gives your employees a basis on which to challenge your decisions and to potentially bring, bring claims. I am updating information as quickly as I physically can on um, LinkedIn is the one that I tend to, to use. Um, Birkett Long do have a COVID-19 blog um, that you can look at. And I, I'm not sure whether or not my updates on the, the furlough scheme have, have gone live on that yet or, or not. But they're probably the best ways to keep up to date from, from Birkett Long. Although in the survey at the end, I'll share a link with you. You can sign up to receive information from Birkett Long completely free, no obligation for you to, to use us, but it's a means of you keeping, keeping up to date. So if I have a look at the questions, I'll just see um, if we've got any more, and then hopefully if I can get it, do not happen. Um, oh, I've lost it. Q&A, here we go, right, let's see if we can move it across, there we go. You'll see me frustrated at um, technology not quite working as I think it should. I'm going to leave it on there and I don't know whether you can, that means you can see it or not. Um, but let me skip through. Um, and that. Let's 
So long term sick until the 9th of July, move them from SSP to furlough. Yes, potentially, I think that would be certainly something for you to consider. So moving somebody who's, who's not due to return from sick leave until the 9th of July. There are some complicated provisions around individuals who are on unpaid sick leave, um, as well as around if they are receiving sick pay. So it's something that is worth thinking about um, and, and just you may need to take some advice from your, from your advisors around that and the practicalities and legalities of, of, of how, to, how to do that. Okay, so redundancy process, lady on notice, that runs out on the 24th of July. Can we finalise our redundancy? Okay, so this is around, this question I think is, is broadly speaking, if we've identified somebody is at risk of redundancy, um, and their employment giving, if we give them notice, would end prior to the end of the furlough scheme. Do you have to extend employment to take into account furlough? In my view, the simple answer to that question is no. I was very concerned at the start of, of, of this crisis and when furlough was introduced that any decisions by employers to make individuals redundant rather than to um, keep them on furlough, especially if they've got more than two years service, run the risk of it being un unfair. Um, however, because the furlough scheme has been extended and because of the phraseology around the furlough scheme, if an individual's job will not exist into the future, in my view, you can issue notice and individuals employment can end prior to the end of the furlough, excuse me, prior to the end of the, the furlough scheme. Um, but the key point there is that, that the role has, will not exist beyond, beyond furlough, rather than it being, we just don't have the business for it at the moment. Um, in which case my view would be it should be, it should continue, their employment should continue for the duration of furlough unless economics means it's it, it, it's difficult. So I think that answers the next question in terms of um, waiting until the furlough scheme comes to an end. As I say, it really it really does depend on the on the circumstances. And if you're concerned, take advice from your 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 advisors to um, check what their their views are. And I know there are differing differing opinions, but the guidance is very, very clear that redundancies can be made during furlough and the, the grant can be used towards notice, but it can't be used towards redundancy payments. All right. So am I anticipating additional claims who return and then claim they've become unwell? I will be honest and say I wouldn't be at all surprised. Um, the reality is that individuals are increasingly litigious. So I think the risk here is obviously they are saying that you, you they've returned to work, they've caught COVID-19 in the workplace and they bring a claim against you in relation to, to that. I mean, I think I would question what's the likely value of that claim would be, um, albeit that it's likely to be a loss of earnings for however long they they are unwell, but they would have to demonstrate that it is the workplace where they have caught that. And absolutely right, Sarah, if you've carried out a risk assessment, you are evidencing that you're um, enforcing any um, provisions, procedures that you've put in place. So if you have PPE, making sure people are wearing it and actually requiring them to, to wear it and that type of thing. Document everything that you are doing. 
in um, in my view, you should be in a reasonable position to be able to to defend that situation. But it's it's entirely possible individuals will start to to bring claims of of those of that nature. So individual who is vulnerable, returning to work, kept apart. Um, I must admit, I'm not entirely up to date with the position on vulnerable staff. They, I know that there's a there's a relaxing of the situation. Um, but in, in my view, I think they, they, they're still being told, I think, to only leave the house once and that they shouldn't be attending, attending the workplace. And in my view, you're best to, you're best to, to, to stick to that, that guidance. So if they can't work from home, in my view, they'll, they would remain on, on furlough if, um, if that's what they, where they've been. So, um, Gloria, in terms of calculation of redundancy, my, um, my view on how that's calculated, it should be calculated on normal pay rather than redundancy, rather than their furlough pay. So if pay has been restricted to 80%, the redundancy payment should be paid at 100%. Um, so calculated as you would do in the normal, in the normal course of things. There are question marks around um, entitlements to, to notice and arguably you might be able to um, restrict notice to furlough pay, but you'd need to double check then what notice they're entitled to and how that compares to minimum, minimum entitlements. Um, so um, there's a, another question here around vulnerable individuals so they can't work from home and worried yeah I mean it, around that as I say I think with vulnerable individuals high risk individuals you will need to look at the guidance and potentially either SSP or, or furlough um, I think I'd be cautious about putting them on to onto SSP on the basis that the chances are that they might be a disabled person and therefore have a protected characteristic which in turn might give them the ability to um, claim indirect discrimination if they're placed onto SSP rather than um, furlough pay albeit that that is a, a, a potential issue. So next can you ask for evidence from an employee if they need to self-isolate um, does this breach G GDPR? I, I haven't seen one of these uh, notifications yet, so I don't know what information they include. But ultimately, as an employer, you are entitled to evidence that the individual is being required to self-isolate. And the best way of doing that is passing the notification on. If and someone's not willing to do that from a GDPR perspective, then, you know, you might ha ask them to do a video call. They can show you the notification so you're not retaining any of that information. You can make a note to say that you've seen satisfactory evidence and that might be a, a, sensible, a sensible way around that potential issue. So I think I've answered, oh goodness, every time I scroll down there's more. Um, what I'm going to do, I'm going to open this up to um, my colleagues who are also online. I'm probably desperately going to make sure that their um, video links all work, etc. Um, but just before I do, I'm just going to mention a couple of housekeeping points. Birkett Long are running some free, um, what we're calling Wednesday webinars, which are taking place, as you've guessed it, on a Wednesday. On Wednesday, I am talking about a return to work in a little bit more detail than I have today. And I am joined by one of my colleagues in the intellectual property um, department team who's going to be just talking about intellectual property, property issues. So please do have a look at that. We're looking at 
um, COVID-19 issues, both from a commercial perspective, but also individuals. So you as private individuals, so you might find something of interest. I'll post these links before we, before we finish into the chat box, so you can just copy and paste them from there. Copies of the slides will go on to the Birkett Long Events um, resource page with the, slot, with the password, which is the number 20, double capital L, lockdown, lowdown, 0601, which is obviously um, today's date in a hybrid form. And as I say, I'll post these links. We've got um, a SurveyMonkey questionnaire for today. We do like to receive your feedback. As part of that, we ask you if you've got any ideas for future online events. All of our events will be online up until at least January next year. So please do put forward any suggestions that you might have. And just a reminder that we're on LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, and you can follow us on Eventbrite for um, I'm going to minimise that just in case you can't see them. Um, you can follow us on Eventbrite for when we launch new events. We have got two events coming up. Um, how is artificial intelligence revolutionising the employee and candidate experience? That's on the 4th of June, so Thursday of this week. Tickets are still available for all of these. And uh, the links are there. I'll post these. Next event is Mental Toughness for Wellbeing, which is next Tuesday, I think. Um, that's a lunchtime slot for you. So if you're interested in either of those, please do, please do um, register. They are both members only events, I'm afraid. So if you're not a member of the CIPD, I'm afraid you will not be able to, to join that. That's just a reminder for any suggestions. The survey does also, as I mentioned before, include the option for you to ask for information from Birkett Long. Um, we cannot, with my CIPD hat on for a moment, CIPD cannot pass your details and I will never pass your details that I receive through CIPD to Birkett Long. So if you want to receive information from Birkett Long, you need to give that information so we can pass it across. So that's me, that's my contact details and the Survey Monkey link. And I am going to open up to um, my colleagues from the team so that we can see if anyone's got any comments um, or want to ask any questions on screen. If I can work out how to stop sharing and then hopefully we'll go. There we go. So I might need to track down some of my other colleagues as well. Um, Brian is here, so I'm going to promote him. So if you have got any comments that you want to make or questions, then I think probably the easiest thing is if you raise your hand and hopefully one of my colleagues will twig that you've raised your hand and we can have a chat. Let's see if there's anyone else here. No, I think that's all we've got from the committee there. So uh, Emma has raised a hand. So that is Emma. So let me see if I can find the participants now. I should never, never do these sorts of things on the hoof. Let's see. My daughter's laughing at me as well. Thanks, Alex. So we've got Dawn. So I'm going to allow Dawn to talk. Over to you, Dawn. Who's on mute? Hello. Hi, Dawn. Hello, you're right. Yes, I'm that well. Was, that was very informative. And um, yeah, the ever changing world of furlough. I think it's kept us all in for the last three months. Um, I, I was thrilled on Friday afternoon. I know. Uh, someone needs to speak to uh, our Chancellor Exchequer and ask him to make uh, announcements on any other time other than five o'clock on a Friday because he seems to do all of his on five o'clock on Friday. He does. He does. I think he probably thinks we've got nothing better to do over the weekend. But I think what was the big thing I've taken out of today is you clarifying the point about 
furlough on the 10th of June because I read it like you did that they had to be furloughed on the 10th of June so that's a real that is quite flexible for everybody I think going forward yeah I mean I think um and it makes it makes sense because I think if businesses had to have everybody on furlough from the 10th of June they're not likely to have very many people in no is, is the reality because I suspect that a lot of businesses want to be able to flexibly furlough um, from from the 1st of July um, and I, I'm really pleased actually he's brought that date forward because I think it gives employers a lot of options but in, in terms of the decisions now obviously business need to look at who hasn't already been furloughed and who they might want to use it for in the future um, and Otherwise, you know, anyone who's already been furloughed, they've got that right anyway. Yeah, they're true. And I think the other biggest consideration for us HR professionals is, as you touched upon, is contractual and, um, yeah, how does it go on in the future? I've forgotten the phrase now, was it? Yeah. Customer practice. Yeah, sorry. Um, yeah, that's a big implication. And, and also, at the moment, we had a conversation this morning about health and safety. At the moment, because it's a temporary arrangement, I think most businesses are kind of ignoring the health and safety working at home, but the longer it goes on, the more it's going to become more and more important. Yeah, well, I, th I think that's, that's true. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm quite lucky that I've got, I've got a desk, I've got two screens, I've got a keyboard that, um, you know, works and a mouse and, you know, that type of stuff. And I, th I think I'm probably a lot better off than, a good number and you know you hear of um you know people working on their beds people working you know wherever they might be able to perch um and i think well the reality is this is going to go on for some time and you know the the, the guy or you know the pm has said for the foreseeable future people should be working from home where they can um, and I think businesses need to, if they haven't already, get wise to that and carry out workplace assessments, albeit that that workplace is home. Definitely, agree. And there's some big organisations um, looking at not taking people back to sort of this time next year. They've already been told. Yes. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But just on that point as well, though, I would just say it's not just... The obligation in respect of health and safety doesn't just rest with the employer. The employee has to has an obligation to look after their own health and safety as well. So it's not going to be as simple as, well, I've been working at home on a bed for the past X months and the business didn't carry out a work assessment. You know, if they're starting to experience difficulties, they should be talking to their employer and they should be saying, I'm starting to experience difficulties. What can we do? Oh. And I think I think that's an important point to to to, to bear in mind. All right. Has anyone else got any comments that they want to make? Anyone else want to raise their hand as I have a look through someone else? Come on. Susanna, are you raising your hand deliberately? Yes. <laughs> Go on. Um, can you hear me? I can. Okay. Um, it was just, um, I think, reflecting the fact that um, a number of um, schools have gone back today. Um, kids yeah. have gone back to school. Nurseries, year one and six and the implications that's going to have on some families because some may find that some of their if they've got more than one child at home one child may be going back but others aren't and the implications yeah. of that with on working and ability to go back into the workplace or continue yeah. working from home yeah i mean i think um I mean, we, we back onto a school here and the noise levels has increased markedly. Um, but ultimately, yes, some families are going to find themselves in a situation where they've got one child at school, one child not at school or more, as the case, as the case may be. 
and ultimately businesses are going to need to be sympathetic to that and over the past two three weeks certainly I and my team we've been advising people around you know what what can we do um you know we need to get this individual back into the workplace but they've got childcare issues um and it's I think we need to be as flexible as we as we can on it and realize that individuals are not going to be as able as we might like them to be to return um and ultimately the option remains that they can stay on furlough um if if that's the case um but i appreciate that there may be some circumstances where business needs to get people back and that's going to be a, a headache that people will need you know you might need to take advice on um because you are stepping into potential indirect discrimination territory yeah. um and there's there's other issues around if they're concerned about the risk of the risk of infection and, and health and safety as well um or care issues so they're, they're the three areas where you need to be you need to, you would need to be be cautious so there's just a couple of points here so um anonymous has said um much as my understanding was on friday evening that there's two schemes and that's not the case we have a single furlough scheme um but in order to take advantage of that furlough scheme which can allow for flexibility or it can allow for an individual to be furloughed for the entire working week individual employees have to have completed three weeks furlough by the 30th of june so for example i've not been on furlough um, and if Birkett long wanted to be able to bring me back flexibly from the first of july or indeed keep me on furlough into the future i would need to have been placed on furlough by the 10th of june um, so anyone that you're still you're, you're continuing to use or you're using the scheme for can continue to be used um but it's it's anyone who you haven't already furloughed and you might want to either to furlough them permanently or to bring them back flexibly you need to have done that by the 10th if that makes sense um i'm just checking to see if anyone else has raised their hand So someone who's shielding wants to come back to work again, I think, as I mentioned before, it's a case of looking at the advice and the extent to which allowing them to return is within the guidance. And you can do that. You can do that safely, bearing in mind what we said in terms of the risk of future claims for anyone who might be, you know, contract the, the, the virus. In, in the workplace and, and be at greater at greater risk. Um, employees who are furloughed just been made redundant, stating should be paid overtime. Uh, so overtime, it's not contractual. As, as I mentioned earlier, it will depend on the um, the position. Non well, discretionary overtime shouldn't contractual. Um, should be that's something for you to take advice on I know that the HMRC are supposedly building in an ability to correct claims um, so hopefully if if something's not been processed quite right you should be able to correct that at some point in the in the future so struggling to work from home cannot return to the workplace um, can they can they not return if they want to provide it yeah i mean if, if if somebody for whatever reason is struggling to work from home and they want to come into work i don't see if there's any reason why they couldn't if it's at their request it's more an issue if it's the if it's the other way around albeit that technically where they can work from home they should be working from from home but you know as i say if health and safety provisions are there then I, I think that's probably probably okay albeit not necessarily within within the guidelines so final question i think before we before we close currently having them at risk role is diminished due to covid and foreseeability 
and in the future won't the employee shielding has been furloughed plan is to make employee redundant two weeks notice can we serve notice now um, yes you so you've identified somebody as at risk of redundancy um, you're planning to implement that from the 31st of July you can give notice now and or is that to be paid in full um, as I say notice and the extent to which it should be paid in full or not depends on whether it is or how, how much notice under the contract you should give and how it compares to the statutory minimum period of notice if it's more than one week more then arguably you can pay notice just based on the furlough pay with no obligation to top up if it's minimum statutory minimum notice then it will always be full pay um, because of a, a provision in the in the employment rights act okay so i don't think anyone else i think i've answered all the questions that i've had through in the q a um, i'm sorry if i've missed any that have made it into the chat box rather than the the q a i can't see anyone with their hands up at the moment so unless anybody's got anything else that they want to say what i am just going to do is dig out the links to um if i can just get rid of that i will dig out the links to the survey and also the upcoming events and i'll post those into the chat box so they're now there so please do take a moment to complete the survey we'd love to know what you've thought about today we'd love to have your ideas about future events we've got the um two links in there for the two upcoming cipd events and also the link in there for where the notes and the slides will be deposited um, hopefully that will be overnight i need to just finalize reviewing the retention that the furlough scheme notes make sure they're completely up to date following friday um, so as i say they'll be up to date next week but not next week tomorrow if not earlier and i think unless there's anything else does anyone else from um the committee want to say anything before we before we go no, i'm fine thanks julie very good uh, very good presentation very informative thank you thanks brian and no thanks julie it was amazing and just in awe of how much work you do and how you keep this stuff in your head thank you yes well i i'm, I'm very i i will be honest and say i finished the slides at about quarter past three oh. and <laughs> i haven't had a chance to even print off my notes um so I've done this completely, completely and utterly on the fly, which hopefully hasn't shown. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, it, it's, it's interesting times, isn't it? And um, hopefully we will, um, all, or we, we all will get through it. Um, but as I, said, I think the important thing to take away now is look at anybody who you've not furloughed to date mm. and who you might want to furlough in the future. Make sure they're on furlough by the 10th. And also, if you are looking at minimising any contributions to furlough pay, you're going to have to start to look at notice and you're going to have to start to look at the redundancy processes. And remember the time frames for collective consultation. So if you're 20 or more in a particular place, then it's 30 days. If you're 100 or more, it's, um, it's 45 days. So you're going to have to factor that into, into your processes. All right. Thanks, so, Julie. Well, thank you everyone for listening. It's great to have had so many. We've we reached 100 and something at, at, at certain points. And I know that people are taking advantage of the ability to um, watch after after the event. So it, we've recorded it. People will be accessing it later and you will be able to 
um, obviously access and recording yourself as well. So thank you very much. Look forward to seeing you at one of the upcoming events um, and hopefully we'll, we'll, well, yeah, that's all I can say. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.